Pop up, pop up, pop up, pop up, pop up, pop All right. Hello and welcome to anyone watching this for either past, present, or future. And welcome to another one of my magical lectures. And tonight, we are going to be going over dragons. Uh, now, I do understand uh, that dragons are a very, very broad category. But the goal of tonight is to give you a general introduction to what dragons are and going into one of the several branches of the Draconic family. Because uh, a dragon is like any other species of animal, and there are way too many of them. <laughs> They're like elves in that way, where it's like, oh, you think you know what an elf is because you've seen a high elf once? No, you idiot. There are like several genuses of the elf. And the same can be said about things like the dragon, or a cat, or a dog. <laughs> So, with that, we're probably going to be more focusing on one general family in the Draconic line. So, yeah, I think I am going to get rid of my miscellaneous loading and then get my slideshow ready. I may see a little bit of a sneak peek before I go to full screen, but do trust me. Where's my loading? Okay. Gotta turn on... Interwebs? Interwebs? Hello? Oh, there you are. Okay. Pop. Alright, I'm just gonna see how that looks on stream. Uh, okay, it looks a little... It looks a little wonky, so we're gonna trunk it down a bit. Dragons, there could be two types of dragons that are on the moon nowadays. Alright. But yes, there are there are many dragons out there. That is why we're going very simply with just one type of dragon. And if you guys are more interested in this topic, we can always go in and do more draconic lectures. Because Jesus Christ, dragons really like to make themselves important in many ways. <laughs> Tea dragons. Honestly, tea dragons I see very much being a thing. Uh, I can imagine specifically fairy dragons being very much into tea. Uh, I know a lot of the uh, metallic dragons are very down to have tea with people, but we're not talking about that tonight. Those aren't true dragons. I don't know what you're talking about. There are two different dragons that are moon related. There is the Moonstone Dragon and the Amethyst Dragon, which I think lives on the moon. But those types of dragons aren't really well researched. Uh, so that's why that's gonna have its own stream there. Uh, two dragons are in a comic you love. Oh, that's adorable, shiny purple pants. That's adorable. All right, so we're gonna go in and I'm going to start it. So you may ask yourself, Oh no! Thank you, Dra- Oh no, oh no! Oh no, that- that looks too wonk! That looks way too wonky! Oh no! I hate how, because it's in slideshow mode, I can't, like, show you how it all looks. Okay. Or I can't show myself how it should look, so it's- Give me a moment. Okay, we're gonna do some experimenting live. No! I feel like, I feel like now every teacher in the last decade. Alright, so we're gonna go more here. Yeah, no, I'm trying to fix it. 
No, that's so really crop. Okay, I get. No. All right. Okay. I guess. I guess I gotta shrink it down. Oddly enough. Shrink it down, but more towards here. Is that what's gonna make it look right? Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, I'm looking at. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's. It's a little off, but it's okay. I think we can. I think we can go without the first letter. So I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna just. Just gonna. You know what? No, I'm just gonna move this drago up here. Up. All right. So you may ask yourself, what are dragons? Because dragons. There are a lot of things they are, and quite a few things that they're not. Uh, to begin with, dragons tend to be very large. Uh, on average, tend to be very large. Uh, though that's not always normal, so we can't go with size. What we can go off of is sort of common traits a lot of dragons tend to have. First off, they are reptilians. They are very much in the reptilian line, uh, the reptilian family. Uh, they are surprisingly warm-blooded. Uh, which is very abnormal for reptiles. Um, oftentimes they have wings. There's only very few cases where they don't. Um, but flying is a major consideration. Uh, as well as the ability to breathe out an element. Now with an element I'm not talking about in an alchemical sense. Because if you talk to chemists, they would go, oh, so does that mean they can breathe neon? No, I'm I'm talking in the most, uh, in an elemental sense that one would think when they were watching Avatar, The Last Airbender, those types of elements, uh, as it were. Uh, and the most common types of elements you'll see dragons uh, breathing out is typically fire, is one of the most iconic ones. That's the one where people think of very often when they think of dragons. Uh, however, they can go in various different uh, types of energy, such as lightning, uh, yes, lightning, cold, acid, and poison. Those five tend to be the most common elements that tend to be breathed out. There are some exceptions to this, but those are very notable and rare instances. So, throughout most dragons, specifically throughout the chromatic and metallic categories, tend to have the ability to breathe out those five elements. Uh, oftentimes, dragons will have this, um, have this breath stored in an organ known as the dragon's stomach, which tends to either form either a gas or the method to produce this element, store it, and then eject it. Uh, save, for dra save for a red dragon, which we see here in our slide, uh, fighting another dragon. The red dragon would perhaps have a dragon stomach that would contain a flammable gas, such as either methane, um, maybe something sulfuric. Uh, it can really depend depending on the dragon's genetics and maybe its environment. But for the most part, there was a flammable gas in there, and when, and maybe they flick it on their, uh, some people have suggested that there's a, their tongues are very sharp and it, they can slide it against their skull akin to a match, so then it breathes out fire, uh, for an extended period of time. Uh, and a lot of dragons, specifically as they mature, get a particular talent for not only being able to breathe this devastating weapon, uh, this devastating natural weapon that they can just blast on into a massive range, but also the speed in which they are able to do this. Um, most people have found the fastest time the dragons have been able to continuously release their breath weapon is within a span of six seconds. And although that's not average, it's still the fact that that can happen at a pretty reasonable pace, and that's horrifying. <laughs> is every dragon, uh, from how you train to dragon, technically uh, a red dragon? 
Not the case. Um, although many dragons are known for uh, their scales, uh, which is the simple name scheme, uh, shiny purple pants, I will say in the top of my head, uh, although I do know a lot of them do breathe fire and how to be their dragon, uh, we'll get to this later on in the lecture, but there is, I do recall in that motion picture, there is a twin-headed dragon that does breathe poison. That is a great example of a green dragon, which will be uh, discussed later on. Uh, but I would say because of how to breathe, how to train your dragon, it's very much in a different multiverse uh, than this one and the ones I have been through. Uh, they sort of operate in adjacent rules. Um, but in the case of this lecture, I'm mostly going off of uh, sort of my own uh, the multiverse I am most familiar with, and as well as, uh, the one I am, uh, projecting to. Uh, but that is a very good question. Uh, always be critical about what it, about what you're consuming, and asking yourself the questions, what is it, and what is it truly? Because, some things are tricky. But, yes, so, again, okay, major requirements, typically reptilian, warm blood, flight, ability to breathe an element of some sort. And those are the physical characteristics of a dragon that most people would associate and gravitate towards to classify it as a dragon. But there are key states, there are key aspects of the mentality of a dragon. Dragons are very intelligent creatures. Uh, even some of those at the lower, at the more uh, primal ends of the spectrum for dragons, they still have great intelligence. Say some higher up, higher dragons with higher cognitive function are on pair of very intelligent people, whereas those on the lower scale are more very intelligent animals such as dolphins, orcas, and perhaps even elephants. Uh, more in that intelligence range. Uh, where they're animalistic, but they're very intelligent in how they can form strategies. Um, so they would need is a considerable amount of intelligence. Uh, dragons tend to have a sense of ego that's very prevalent throughout dragons consistently. Uh, a lot of dragons either have a sense that they are the, or if not the most important person, one of the most important people out there in the world. Uh, as such, uh, this could be taken in various ways. Uh, in traditional studies, a lot of, one of the most uh, archived uh, dragon families, the chromatics and the metallics, uh, those two tend to take it in very different spectrums. Uh, metallics uh, tend to see that as they're the, they are heroes, but the only heroes out there, um, and that they're the ones who need to save the world and do righteous acts, or maybe even that they think they're the only ones who can bear certain tasks um, and are capable of it and will often reject help and insist that they're the only ones who are able to do it, uh, unless pushed to such extremes. Uh, but then you get to... Uh, more chromatic dragons who very much realize how powerful they are and will assert that for dominance. Um, a lot of the chromatic dragons said it very territorial because of this. They believe that what they, anywhere that they can fly to, that is what they think is relatively close uh, to their uh, den is, is theirs. Uh, it is their territory, it is their land to claim, because they are the strongest thing there, they know this, they are an apex predator, and they will do as much as they can to establish this. Um, so, yes, they get a sense of entitlement, oftentimes, or they may get a sense of them having a savior complex, at the best case scenario. Um... And another thing that's very often for dragons is hoarding. Many dragons, if not all dragons, 
have a recorded history of hoarding. Now, oftentimes in legends, you hear the hoarding as uh, gold, valuables. And in many cases, this is true. A lot of dragons like having money uh, or gold because they've realized that is a power status for a lot of other intelligent creatures. So, on one hand, it's an aspect of, it's a symbol of power, right? If they have the most money, they are, they see themselves more dominant as, say, humanoids who collect and work for all this money, who dig it up and everything, and they take it, and they go, yes, this is mine, I have the most of it, I'm better than you. Uh, additionally, though, uh, they may collect, say, magic items, uh, for this also power status, or maybe even ways to get a bit more power later on. Um, some dragons, uh, in particular gold dragons, uh, which we may get into more in another lecture, do eat gold as a treat, leisurely. Uh, so it would be similar to some dra- in some cases, it would be similar if a dragon collected a very certain type of material, such as gold, maybe diamonds, to collect them and use it as a snack, as if someone is hoarding a bunch of chocolate. Um, in many- in some cases, though, gold or valuables may not be the only thing a dragon hoards. Uh, in fact, there is a draconic word, uh, for a hoard, which is a half-keep, a half-kip, which a lot of people, uh, got a very literal translation of half-keep. Uh, half kip is basically whatever the dragon is fixated on and wants to collect and store and not anyone else to have because they want it and it is theirs. They feel very protective about it, typically because they care about it very genuinely. Um, some dragons may do this for sending items to talk to and have company. Others may do it for actual people. Maybe they have an interest in odd collectibles uh like say in the modern era if there was a dragon out there uh who was very attached to pokemon growing up they would very much want to collect all the pokemon cards and i mean all of them uh and keep them very precious to themselves uh or say if one was very into uh a particular literature uh it is not uncommon for some to collect a lot of books uh, a lot of knowledge and lore um, they could be very diverse in what they're, excuse me, in what they want to obtain. Uh, modern day dragons would be billionaire otakus. I mean, frankly, in layman's terms, that is very accurate. Yes, they feel, if they feel very passionate about something, they will collect it. Uh, as much as possible. Um, whatever it may be. Um, and that may be another reason to motivate a dragon to collect a vast wealth, is to enable them to get what they want. Because uh, maybe they can't take it by force, even though they totally can. But maybe, just maybe, they may not admit it. It's crazy, I know. Um, those surprisingly rich furries are <laughs> mostly silver dragons. Perhaps. Well, those, those, those like to interact with people, but again, I'll save that for a separate lecture. Um, but because of dragons, uh, oftentimes, uh, coming to get, uh, trying to hoard a vast amount of wealth, as well as their dominance complex, they do form a culture. Uh, they, they do, they have formed a legacy of sorts. Uh, and some of that may be from them being very horny. Uh, dragons are... They're... They can have, they can have seasons of heat, as it were. Um, and you may see a lot of jokes, uh, in, in sort of your, your circles of the Dungeons and Dragons that the Bard wants to, um, have intercourse with the dragon. And this is a bold accusation, because if anything, one, the, the bard or storyteller here will not likely be the one who will be uh, fucking uh, the specimen known as the dragon. No, the dragon is going to be the one on top. Um, and 
this dragon uh, will likely be the one insisting that they want this. Um, as such, as as time had gone on, uh, passes the time of dragons, that is when you get Dragonkin coming into the world. That's when you get uh, creatures such as Hack Dragons, uh, then eventually Dragonborn. Uh, kobolds get in there somewhere. They're they're weird. They're they're a weird genetic anomaly. Um, that's where you really get the start of dragons sort of not only being a solitary um, a solitary uh, creature who is capable of just committing great feats by great power, but now they are learning uh, as time goes on that they have a people in which they can use and encourage their own uh, their own desires and life and to maintain their lifestyle. And here's where we get to uh, sort of the old standard of draconic culture. Now, I do want to keep in mind uh, as we go into this, uh, times have changed quite a bit uh, towards the modern era. But this is sort of uh, what dragon and what dragons and their kin are sort of known for. Uh, and it's not a pleasant, uh, it's not a pleasant, uh, reputation. Uh, it frankly is very similar to, say, how orcs or how maybe goblins are seen in the sense of being more, definitely more of an aggressive people, uh, because of this culture and what I will elaborate in. Uh, and the picture I will show in this next slide may bring some context to how this is the case. Welcome, we're going to talk about the draconic culture of old, other known as the collector era of dragons. Now you may ponder, what is, what is quite the nature I am witnessing on this picture? Well, back when uh, Dragonborn society was really starting to exist and become a significant, like, a noticeable, um, uh, population, uh, dragons would use them as essentially, uh, workers for them, uh, and dragons would use them to enforce, uh, the territory they have by collecting tribute, uh, and this tribute would be taxing the people who would live around that area uh, for the right of the dragon existing there. Now this is more often for chromatic dragons, but this is again what most people are familiar with, with chromatic dragons. Uh, and chromatic dragons just specify uh, so we know what context we're going into more, and I don't, I don't talk about it as if this is all dragons, this is mostly what chromatic dragons are known for. Um, chromatic dragons are typically known uh, for their color, uh, as opposed to their material, like other dragons. Uh, this in most encompasses white, black, green, blue, and red dragons in particular. Um, but focusing more on this, um, so yes, chromatic dragons in particular would send out their dragon board, or even half dragons uh, in some cases, to go down to towns uh, that were considered under the dragon's territory, and then they would ask for a uh, payment, a uh, tribute, as it were, to their new draconic leader uh, for protection. And if they did not pay the tribute, uh, either the dragonborn would uh, attempt to persuade them through violence, or uh, the dragon himself may uh, attempt to persuade with violence. Um, so, yeah, uh, essentially, uh, the old draconic culture is comparable to an old-fashioned crime syndicate. Yes. Now, I find it very interesting the wording, uh, that you have there, shiny purple pants, of the dragon mafia. And it is more close, uh, the namesake is more closely to another crime syndicate. Uh, the often draconic word, uh, for this, uh, style of governing, uh, was called the Dracuza. 
Uh, and the Tracuse is very much a name that is feared uh, throughout many areas and is sort of where um, more modern crime syndicates uh, sort of take on that aspect now. Uh, and it's, it's an old draconic word, uh, basically me meaning like dragon loyalty. Um, so, yeah, yeah, um, it's a, it's a very peculiar word, especially how it, uh, happens to overlap with some, uh, languages here in the Prime Material. Um, but yes, it was, it was quite something. Uh, oftentimes there would be a strong hierarchy within the, uh, Dracuza. Oftentimes the dragon... Uh, that would be in charge of the territory, be obviously the main person in charge. Anyone who would be lo the immediate lower people would be within its presumable family. So if it had a younger dragon uh, that it was raising, it could be a possible heir or a short time uh, consultant, um, perhaps maybe even uh, some, yeah, mostly a consultant. Uh, alternatively, it could be other heirs, uh, such as half dragons, uh, which is the most direct line between dragon and uh, humanoid. Uh, so that would be like, say, if a dragon really wanted to have a good time with an elf, and they produced an offspring, that offspring would be a half dragon, and will likely live a very long time. Because uh, dragons themselves also live significantly long. Uh, with dragons, oftentimes it is very rare that a dragon dies of old age. Uh, dragons are akin to lobsters in that sense, where they don't die unless they are killed. Uh, it is more likely uh, that a dragon does not die restfully on uh, restfully in their sleep. Uh, in fact, in most cases, that uh, dragons that uh, most dragons uh, that don't die in combats tend to die more off from disease, um, from maybe a weaker immune system at their older age. Um, but it's very rare that one dies of just the body ceasing to work, such as unlike other humanoids or mortals. So yes, they can live; they can easily outlive a, uh, a very old elf. In their in their twilight years, uh, typically, uh, when one dragon gets to the status of ancient, is at a thousand, and it is not always common because dragons are very aggressive with each other. But it has been recorded quite a few times. Um, but yes, uh, and if you got that with an elf, gave it a half dragon. That dragon, that spawn, is gonna live a long ass time, if not killed. Um. And then it would go down to the Dragonborn. Uh, and then after that, it would probably be down towards any people who were uh, recruited to join the Dracuza out of debt. Uh, essentially people who are uh, indebted, basically indentured servants to the Dracuza uh, for anything they don't really want to do. Anything that isn't particularly flashy or... Um, particularly a big job, like, say, going into a town collecting tribute, they would be more, say, um, hey, we want you to take care of this guy, uh, and make it not look like a big deal. Uh, like, they would basically be treated almost as sleeper agents, if not for manual labor. Uh, and underneath that would be the kobolds, uh, who are smaller dragonoids, uh, draconic humanoids, uh, if anything, they resemble a lot more of a, um, of a gecko, uh, but they do have, they are related to dragons in, like, the same way a dog is related to a bear. Like, yes, your pug does share genetics with a grizzly bear. But they are very different animals. Um, so, yes. Uh, but they're often used as scouts or general henchmen. Uh, they're very good at setting up traps. Uh, since they're not particularly strong, 
they very much share that keen uh, craftiness that dragons tend to have uh, without their sort of uh, inherent strength. So they tend to be definitely the more crafty ones. They don't get a lot of credit, uh, but they're usually your spies, scouts, uh, guy you pick up if you want to throw his fodder, or uh, the type of people you're gonna make crew traps uh, for your perimeter. Uh, also, yes, Sir Frog, we are learning about dragons. We are doing uh, specifically chromatic dragons. Uh, we have gone over basically what qualifies as dragon, as well as talking about the old draconic culture uh, known as the Dracuza, uh, which to sum up this point is basically uh, almost a crime syndicate esque style of dragons uh, after getting dragonborn would send the dragonborn uh, onto a town that they claim to own and then demand tribute uh, for protection. Uh, and of course, if they did not pay tribute, uh, there would be violence to persuade them. Uh, in, actually, now that I think about it, uh, there is uh, one big discovery that did occur uh, from the Dracuza during this era of time. Uh, it's sort of, it's been archived that Dragonborn made it, however, some scholars debate that a kobold, uh, didn't make this discovery, but it is, uh, recorded that gunpowder was first used under the name of the Dracuza, uh, and most in particular what they would use for is nothing as advanced as guns. That would be more of a gnomish invention later, later on. But what Dragonborn would ascend, what the Dracuza would essentially do is that they would gather a lot of gunpowder and make either very crude bombs or make fireworks, basically. Uh, these fireworks would be used as rocket launchers uh, or something to launch at, uh, typically at a house or building as a sign of intimidation um, due to the fact that they have found out how to make things go boom big. Um, and oftentimes they would try to make the, uh, color of the fire typically of the same color of their, uh, dragon, uh, as sort of a, uh, sign of, uh, dominance and, uh, pride. So, yeah, that's something wild. Um, yeah, no, I think in particular it was a blue, uh, surprisingly enough it was a blue dragon, uh, clan, I think that found it, as opposed to a red dragon, which most people would assume. Uh, but we may go into that more when we go deeper into the blue dragon. Uh, but first, we're gonna go down, uh, sort of the, uh, hierarchy of dragons, uh, for the chromatic side of things. So with the chromatics, as I said before, there are five kinds of chromatic dragons. There are white dragons, black dragons, green dragons, blue dragons, red dragons. And they are sort of in a pyramid, uh, going from white to red. And as we go through these dragons, they will get significantly stronger, uh, both biologically, intellectually, uh, and just in general, it's sort of a natural hierarchy of dominance over each other. Uh, but do not mistake any of these dragons as a joke. If you ever encountered one, you are in the world of hurt. Music's too loud? All right, I will fix that. All right, is that better? Is that better, Silver Frog? It's gonna wait to see if, uh, yes? Okay, perfect, perfect. I hope it was not drowning me out. Uh, but yeah, so we're gonna start with the white dragon. Now, white dragons are often considered one of the most primal dragons. Uh, if anything, they are considered, uh, there's a little which why I mentioned it. Oh, okay. Thank you, Silver Frog. Thank you for mentioning it. Uh, but yes. Uh, white dragons are considered one of the more primal of the dragons, but definitely sort of the first 
Uh, oftentimes, when adventurers will try to hunt down dragons, this is typically what they try for first, and many of them do not come out alive. Uh, it's sort of like a first big roadblock if anyone were to attempt to uh, go after a, a dragon of any kind. Uh, and white dragons are, although they are not la although they are not as, say, considered intelligent, uh, compared to some of our other dragons we'll be covering, they are, again, more comparable to the intelligence of an orca, or a, a wolf, maybe even elephants, uh, more higher thinking animals that may not be as um, intelligent in the means of book smarts, but very much in terms of tactics and capability to hunt down and take out their prey in very brutal and efficient means. Um, a lot of theories of why maybe white dragons are more primal and brutal may be due to their uh, environments. Uh, white dragons tend to be living, they tend to live in tundras or glaciers, uh, you know, very cold environments. Typically any dragon, any white dragon uh, lives around is probably at least freezing, likely going into the negatives. Uh, and they, they are very much seeking any big game in an area where it probably does not have as significant big game. Uh, probably the biggest game out there in those environments would be, say, like, moose, bears, or perhaps any other, uh, larger magical creatures. Uh, so a common theory as to why maybe white dragons are oftentimes, uh, archived as a lot more bestial is because their environment that they can thrive in the most is just the most brutal and the one where they maybe have their less needs fulfilled. So they're more focused in how to obtain that. Um, white dragons uh, are probably one of the, first off, white dragons I think are probably also one of the most interesting in terms of their uh, capability of movement. Uh, they are very fast on land, incredibly fast in the air, but they are also known to be capable of digging. Um, particularly what they will do is go into either, like again, ice glaciers, uh, icebergs, or massive snow banks and dig in, dig massive caverns and um, an intricate burrowing system uh, to form their, their layer and den. Um, oftentimes, uh, because of this, their dens seem to be very deep into whatever massive snow or ice they're in. They can't really, they don't really get a lot of, say, treasure or uh, gems or anything. Uh, what they tend to hunt after more is, say, rare specimens. They, they seem to be a lot more intrigued in, like, seeing different types of animals, rather if it is prey or perhaps something that fascinates them. Uh, say, for example, maybe a white dragon may witness like a pack of mammoths and normally it doesn't see mammoths and instead of eating them like it would be normally it would maybe grow curious and try to freeze them and preserve them and try to get that into its hoard uh maybe things that aren't naturally in its environment like say adventurers oftentimes something that they're fascinated with and will attempt to freeze over and try to uh, keep that into storage, as it were. They, they seem very fascinated by these things, and oftentimes, it seems more often for ancient, uh, for like either, uh, more likely ancient white dragons tend to have a chance to really like study other cultures through sort of this preservation or trying to like, maybe uh, eat out of the ice and try to dig out things of these adventurers to sort of learn culture. Uh, it's kind of, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon, again, comparing to um, when 
uh, compared to the other dragons, which have a bit less of a harsh environment they have to be into uh, to get their food, uh, white dragons tend to have a disadvantage in just being able to learn and have some of their other needs made, met. So it takes them a significant amount of time longer for them to gain maybe skills that other dragons would debatably have. Um, and again, most of it is archived in white dragons to have that level of sophistication and uh, sort of awareness and study. Um, and especially when they're not as perhaps able to be as active as they would like. Um, because let me tell you, arthritis for the bow, for the wings, oof, it's rough, it's rough. Um, but yes, uh, one last uh, fun fact I will leave you uh, for the white dragon is much like how it likes to preserve things, uh, it does like eating things that are frozen. Uh, so if they intend to eat it, they will attempt to encase it in ice uh, and sort of re-eat their ice uh, as a form of getting back hydration, uh, especially in an environment where typically a lot of cold environments are more deserts, ironically enough, because uh, deserts are more defined by their the ability of snow. If it can snow a lot, it's not a desert. Uh, but if it's dry, it's considered a desert. So Antarctica is an example of a desert. And a white dragon that's in Antarctica, it's going to need a way to keep getting water and hydrating, uh, especially if it stays in more in the mainland. Uh, and that is how a white dragon can use, its wa use sort of water reserves, have it out, freeze it, and then sort of recycle it as it were, while also getting some nice, crunchy, uh, flush slushies. Next, we move on to the Black Dragon. And the Black Dragon is a very brutal dragon. This is one of the first dragons that are, that's sort of in this hierarchy that is capable of more complex thought and able to do so at a significant earlier part in life. Uh, these dragons are known as some of the cruelest uh, and mo one of the most sadistic of these dragons. Uh, some theorize it's their ability uh, to breathe out acid that tends to do that, uh, something that maybe they find the fascination of burning. Uh, a chemical burns very intriguing um, but they also live in a very unpleasant environment as well they much like the uh, white dragon which doesn't live in a uh, you know a top 10 uh, biome uh, black dragons tend to live in uh, swamps uh, where there is a lot of murky water a lot of heavy foliage and everything and so some people theorize because of this sort of dingy environment and how there's a lot of bacteria, a lot of a lot of bugs, just a lot of minor things that can make, frankly, unless you're a crocodile, probably very angry and grumpy. That may be why the black dragon, it tends to be a lot more, one of the more aggressive dragons out there and also probably one of the ones that tries to pent out a lot of anger onto others. Um, one of the key aspects of a black dragon, if you were to identify it, uh, would be sort of its scale is larger than a white dragon. However, they tend to have a noticeable uh, set of horns that sort of arch out on the side of their mouth. Uh, a lot of them use this to puncture food if it is really close and then eat it, uh, sort of as like placeholders for food. Um, uh, one trick they like to do is try to get real up close, pin someone down on their horns, and then try to breathe acid out. Uh, so then that, hopefully, to them, the top part of the creature is preserved, but the bottom part is melted down. Um, another reason most people sort of suspect that these uh, dragons are a lot more antagon antagonistic is to the fact that they do have acid, which is, uh, which leads to quite a bit of side effects. Um, 
Whereas most dragons indeed uh, don't die from, say, old age. Uh, they can die from diseases or injuries. Um, one that can happen a lot for black dragons or other acid breathing dragons is, well, continual acid damage. Uh, yes, they are resistant uh, and built to uh, breathe out acid. Oh yes, thank you, Silver Frog. I will. I will get out. I will get out the pretty flower. All right, the professor's got his pretty flower now. Um, where they are built to resist and not deal with acid. They're, it's more so in their scales. Their scales are, their scales are very, very much resistant to chemical burns. Uh, however, uh, their stomach line, their stomach and esophageal linings uh, is very similar to people. However, just more intense. Where yes, they could vomit up sulfuric acid essentially and blast it on uh, to people. However, say, if it got to the state of uh, later adulthood or even the ancient status, that is about several hundred, that is centuries to maybe even a thousand years of continuously blasting acid out from the dragon's stomach out into its sort of second second esophagus and out into victims, uh, which can lead to uh, long-term damage uh, that can either lead them to be unable to breathe out uh, the acid or as potent uh, or as often as they'd like uh, without pain. Um, teeth, there can be quite a bit of dental problems with their teeth being a bit more sensitive. It's it's definitely like things like this that a lot of people sort of assume that a lot of scholars have sort of picked up that maybe again another aspect of why these dragons are very aggressive uh, and sadistic is more in the sense that they themselves are at the extreme discomfort. Uh, oftentimes, uh, a lot of scholars sort of compare it to heartburn uh, for people. Um, and, you know, later adult dragons may feel this sort of sen the, that warm, uh, uncomfortable sensation, but yeah. Aw, her, dra her dragons, her dragons? Yeah, sometimes her dragons are dragons. But yeah, sometimes the hurt dragon is the one who hurts others, like a high school bully, insecure about their feelings. Um... But yes, oftentimes though, um, the style of a black dragonborn would oftentimes uh, be like if someone went into their swamp and uh, want and they wanted to get them out. Unlike say other dragons, which would either terrorize them to let them escape or just crush them, like say a seeing a stink bug in your home uh they would actively more they would taunt and tease the person uh actively playing with their food essentially um and sometimes with this food uh because of their acid breath they tend to try and drink their food more often uh because oftentimes their food will get dissolved uh, as such, dragon, black dragons are known to be very good soup makers or stews, uh, makers of soups and stews, uh, due to the fact that a lot of their food gets melted down at some point. Uh, although they are very capable of eating meat, uh, it is just the night, is just the nature of how a lot of their food ends up being. Um, but yes, they are very, very aggressive and very taunt, uh, they very much love the taunt, uh, and especially in a swamp, they're very much in their environment, being able to not only manipulate some parts of what is deemed their swamp, but also having significant flying speed to get into a lot of blind spots, as well as significant swimming speed. Like, these things can swim twice as fast as a skilled swimmer. 
Uh, so they would probably be going twice the speed of, say, uh, I believe the main swimmer in the current primary material is, uh, Michael Phelps? Yeah, imagine going twice the fast to Michael Phelps, at least. Uh, it could be pretty horrific, especially considering their size. Um, yes, I know oftentimes, uh, Dracuzas, uh, from the Black Dragons, uh, would often be the ones to, uh, see people who don't pay tribute, and instead of maybe take them into an entrance servitude, will actively try to make them miserable, uh, in poor living conditions, uh, typically preventing sleep, or, uh, maybe giving them, uh, worse food, uh, until they can miraculously find a way to pay them. Uh, it's, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely very brutal, uh, and it, it only, it only gets somewhat worse from here with the chromatics. Next we get the green dragonborn. Uh, not the green dragonborn, just the green dragons. Green dragons are what many people consider one of the most intelligent, excuse me, of the, of the chromatics. Now, yes, some people would argue because of the, um, uh, chromatic scale that some dragons, such as blues or reds, are much more intelligent, uh, when it comes to potential. Green dragons have shown probably one of the most elaborate plans, uh, to establish dominance, as well as some of the more well-known Dracuza clans. Um, in particular, what uh, Green Dragonborns will do is oftentimes they will try to form alliances with people or other humanoids to sort of get, sort of um, convince them as sort of an allyship. Uh, as such, they will use this to attempt to uh, get rid of their other enemies by working with, say, another enemy. Uh, like, say, if they had something against a Dwarven Kingdom, they may ally with an Elven Kingdom, provide them great wealth, provide them a lot of resources that they normally wouldn't have, um, and take out the Dwarven uh, Kingdom, raid most of its assets, then prioritize the Elven Kingdom uh, while they are still under the guise of being friends. Um, they are definitely one of the most crafty, most can- they are very charismatic and intelligent. Uh, these dragons are one of the most likely of the chromatics to maybe attempt to learn magic, uh, much farther than just, say, uh, any innate ability. They are most likely to actually become wizards and want to seek, uh, maybe knowledge beyond just, um, their power. Um, as such, they are also very great scholars. Uh, sometimes they may blend in, um, they may try to blend into civilizations and try to pose as significant figures, uh, mostly scholars. Have I done blue dragons? Blue dragons are coming up next after the green, so I have not. Uh, but yeah, no, green dragons are very crafty. Um, oftentimes they, uh, may also, uh, yeah, again, a lot of it is, um, sort of feigning trust and trying to use that against people, oftentimes using a lot of strategy. Uh, some of their, um, Dracuzas are, again, known as some of the most, uh, infamous ones. Uh, not because of their great violence, but more so of them, like, these are the ones that would do very clever, like, white-collar crime. These are the ones that would do a lot of, like, money laundering schemes from, like, any alliances they formed uh, with nations to try and, like, siphon money out, maybe siphon resources, um, and whatnot. And it's, or, like, say, they would have a lot more blackmail tactics than, say, simply going into uh, a town and destroying it. They would more so 
go like, hey, we found out you had a relationship with this person, but you're married. Now we don't want that to happen. So why don't you increase the trivia you're going to give uh, to our patron dragon? And then we will ensure that this doesn't get out where it doesn't need to go. Uh, in situations like that, uh, they are again more manipulative and tricky. As such, their breath weapon is probably one of the most appropriate. Uh, due to the fact they are very toxic individuals, they have they are one of the few dragons that are able to breathe poison. Um, as such, it often comes in large like clouds of gas, um, and it can vary between what kinds of gas it could be. Oftentimes, chlorine, and it is very, very dangerous towards a lot of people, and especially because they don't have to be as direct as, say, uh, other dragons who may shoot out lightning or bursts of cold. Because it is a gas, some dragons may just swoop down a city, do one breath, and then may have a significant portion of the, of the citizens coughing and wheezing, uh, and likely dying from essentially chemical warfare. Um, which in many creatures out there is not very common. Um, and speaking of chemical warfare, that is another thing that, uh, Dick Green and Krakuza has been known for. Unlike some more of these more, uh, unlike some of these more more, uh, unlike some of the dragons we will go over, uh, the last two dragons of this hierarchy, um, some of these would be, uh, you know, making more gunpowder and the like, and using that for explosives, oftentimes what some dragonborn would do in the Jakuza would try to channel their breath weapon uh, into an ob into a capsule of some sort and throw that around to try and get people out of their homes if they felt the need to go aggressive. Um, this has also encouraged their more sly tactics because once they establish a uh, sort of reputation that they can do such very brutal acts, um, yeah, that they can just go like, hey, we know you don't want to do this, and we don't want to do this either. Uh, we don't want to, we don't want to, we don't want to throw this glass ball into your home, make it crash, and make you guys cough and everything. No, we, none of us want that. Our boss kind of wants his money. <laughs> also, I'm glad you're having fun, Silver. I'm glad you're having fun with the uh, with the war crimes dragon. Uh, but yeah, no, these are definitely the ones most known for war crimes, for sure. Um, but yes, these are these are definitely one of the most dangerous to people. Because uh, th surprisingly enough, when you research a lot of creatures in anatomy, uh, poison is most effective on mortals and humanoids and beasts, uh, which happens to be what <laughs> green dragonborns tend to target, surprisingly enough. Wow! Um, but yeah, they are, they are definitely one of the most dastardly, and they are, they will also live in forests. So unlike some other dragonborn which live in some more extreme environments, such as, say, like, this dragon lives upon this mountaintop far away from civilization, or this one dragon lives in the murk, in the murkiest depths of the swamp, or in the coldest tundra. Green dragonborns tend to live in forests, and so if you ever went to a national park, uh, that would be prime real estate for a green dragon. And they are very, they are very huge. They're sort of one of the bigger dragons when like, once you get past black and white dragons, green dragons are a considerable size increase that I think they probably have one of the bigger wingspans of any dragon. It's very real estate. See this, see this forest, this dragon, plop on down there. Get a lot of food. See a lot of villages that like being near the woods. Oh, perfect. Perfect for bribery. cut -ching. Perfect for blackmail and extortation. Hell yeah. Uh, but yes, green dragons. Yikes. And uh, now uh, we get on to a dragon uh, eagerly looking forward to. 
uh, by Silver Frog, and we get the Blue Dragon. Now, the Blue Dragon is one of the most fiercest dragons out there. Uh, oftentimes, again, in this hierarchy, considered to be one of the one of the top three worst dragons you wouldn't want to be around. Oh yeah, yeah, I bet you do. I bet you do. Uh, blue dragons actually would be one of the more common dragons to attack people directly. Um, because these dragons are definitely higher up in sort of the chromatic, um, in the chromatic, uh, hierarchy, these dragons are definitely one of the most ambitious. And a key difference is sort of comparing them to the green dragon. Green dragons will oftentimes seek to manipulate a system and profit off of it. So for again, they would maybe go to a civilization, feign partnership with one, benefit from say being in a war alliance, taking out one side, ravaging it, and then turning on someone or stealing assets from them underneath their nose. And they're content with that. They're content with feeling, knowing that they're the ones on top and uh, getting the real power while also making their neighbors seemingly happy. Blue dragons are not quite satisfied with that. Blue dragons are dragons that seek to be the one on top. They seek a throne. They seek an audience and a people to rule. As such, they're definitely one of the most, uh, one of the more aggressive dragons out there, being the ones that will go out actively attack people. Um, rather it be with the Dracuza clan raiding uh, initially, or having them be the initial one to establish a threat and establishing dominance personally, and then establishing, hey, this is the Dracuza, these are my people, you will pay them taxes for protection, and yeah, no, they are, they are very nasty in that way. Uh, oftentimes, these are one of the most, um, top ten, top, most voted to be a dictator of all, uh, of the drag, of the chromatic dragons. They would, uh, oh, okay, I see I got a, I got a question here. Uh, from shiny purple pants, which is a very good question. Uh, are all dragons evil aligned? They sound evil. And honestly, from what you're hearing in this lecture, you probably would think that. Uh, these are in particular um, chromatic dragons. So this is a family of dragon kind that is known for their horrors and terrors uh, and how their egos are often used to have a sense of entitlement. Not all dragons are evil. Uh, even these dragons could potentially not be evil. These are mostly uh, recorded instances of these dragons. Um, men, there are different types of dragons out there. Um, those in particular uh, which are known for their great axe are metallic dragons. Um, there are some dragons that are simply just out there in the world, um, and they have various different names, rather it be crystal, uh, maybe they're named after a particular stone or environment that they live in. Um, but no, I want to remind everyone, because not maybe not everyone was here at the beginning of the lecture, uh, ego is a big part of what makes a dragon a dragon. Uh, and some dragons take this in the sense of entitlement. Some take this as a sense of maybe some of them are simply selfish but well-intentioned. Some may, be, may see themselves as a noble figure that has to do acts and as such may not know its limits. Um, but no, I, I will probably go over in separate lectures because I only prepared for chromatics, uh, which surprisingly took a bit, uh, which has been going a bit faster than I originally predicted. Um, 
I'll probably go in a separate lecture going over different types of dragons, since this seems to be getting a lot of interest uh, to the people, and I would happily uh, be willing to go on about it. I will probably also go over more types of dragons, again, seeing that the pace of this uh, lecture is going. Um, but yes, uh, it is an understandable thing to hear. Uh, and honestly, most records of dragons tend to be of the more horrible events. Uh, and that is mostly because dragons are very destructive. Uh, rather, if they are doing good or evil things, they decimate areas with their sheer power, health, their wingspans could cause, like, small, almost hurricane effects as they fly by. I, well, you see, Soul Frog, a good portion of this, um, of these lectures are very much, uh, here to go over types of monsters and creatures out there. Um, perhaps maybe when I'm done with dragons, I'll open a bit more. I know my first lecture I was attempting to do was over the undead. Um, and I could always go over more details on that, because necromancy is always fascinating. Um, but, of course, if you have any particular, uh suggestions or requests uh for the future i'm just gonna i'm just gonna send a subtle link here you could always go to my discord and suggest topics and bribe me with being just very interesting and getting my attention i'm not i'm not that hard to please <laughs> uh fair if the dragon just killed alone for 100 years there'd be no records exact well yeah no, essentially. Like, I mean, hell, there may be rest periods between dragons, because dragons still live a significantly long period of time. But, yeah. Like, if anything, a dragon attack would be, like, a major historical event for some people. Uh, because it's like, oh fuck, the dragon came. Can learn this without having to read. Yeah! Why, why read books when you can go to a lecture and obtain information. That's honestly the best way to learn, in my opinion. But, yes. Uh, back to the horrors of Blue Dragon. Uh, but yes, Blue Dragons are definitely one of the more aggressive dragons for their sense of entitlement and sort of seeking to have ambitions to rule a throne. Um, probably one of the best- oh. Pench make an audio <laughs> audiobook monster manual. Oh, you're making me blush! <laughs> You're making me blush. I'm a di well. Okay. To be fair, I am a divination uh, wizard, so my main my main job is to perceive an archive. <laughs> that's why that's why the planes are so fascinating to me. I was very considering. I was very much actually considering going through uh, Electra of the Elemental Planes, uh, but I recently had a discovery of dragons uh, or Dracuzas being the ones to. Uh, use gunpowder before gnomes, so that just made me go, whoa! So it made me really want to talk about, uh, dragons. So I'm talking about dragons. <laughs> um, but yes, back, back to when I'm focused. I need to focus. I need to focus. So, blue dragons. Brutal. Uh, v most likely voted to be tyrant in high school. Um, oftentimes, uh, blue dragons tend to live in they most prefer living in deserts or coastal areas, uh, mostly because they seem to really like how sand uh, works along their scales. Um, they really seem to like how it sort of produces a natural static uh, for them. Some people have tried using their scales to find out exactly why it happens, uh, but not much people really know except maybe the best hypothesis is the fact that their scales seem, the scales and the coarseness of sand seems to be like, cause a little bit of friction to cause, um, a sense of, um, oh, what is the word here? Conductivity, uh, for electricity that they seem to really enjoy. Uh, although I do know that, um, they do. Okay, no, Silverhawk, I don't think. No, that is a thing. Blue dragons will do that thing of jumping and rolling in sand when they are 
when they're just enjoying their time. They don't, they don't tend to bathe themselves in water because that is, like, unless they wanted to actively destroy something, uh, yeah, no, they do that because they, they basically, uh, they basically bathe themselves like chinchillas. They do dust baths. Yes, they do. It's, frankly, this is like in the same level of like a bear that is horrible and ferocious will also do the funny little back scratch dance on trees. It's, it's very similar to that. Um, yeah, you, most people have seen this with younger uh, blue dragons, uh, but uh, some, some people have not caught uh, adult dragons doing that unless they were scrying on them. Uh, not that I have any record of that. <laughs> um, but yes, they do, they will do that to clean themselves. Uh, which they do very much appreciate, since shiny scales is a sign of prestige and, um, sort of the show that they really care about themselves and they are a very clean and noble creature. Which is a cult, which is a trait that a lot of Dragonborn have picked up, um, but blue dragons are probably one of the most appearance conscious in that sense. Uh, besides their scales, they're very much proud of their horn, uh, which you will notice right here. Uh, their sort of unicorn-esque horn here is sort of one of their most uh, predominant traits to identify a blue dragon if one is colorblind and does not see lightning. Uh, yeah, but blue dragons, again, these are, these are intelligent similar to blue, uh, green dragons, but again, they're, I think the best comparisons to behaviors of a blue dragon would be dictators such as Caesar or Napoleon, who would be people who would want to attempt to attain a mass amount of land so that they have a mass amount of land and territory for the status and have all their words be law. Um, because that sense of, that sort of just feeds their ego significantly. Uh, though that does tend to be a common downfall for a blue dragon. Uh, usually it is not their, uh, the brute power uh, that stops them. It usually is people taking advantage of their pride. So... If you're ever going to do a situation and you think you're capable, all you got to do is just, like, insult it enough and then be... Like, if you're a trickster, oh, you can... You can wreck this boy. Uh, but I will say, they are probably... Along with the green dragonborns, probably one of the most formidable Dracuzas in the sense of being one of the most organized Dracuzas out there. Blue dragons tend to have a lot more sense of order uh, than some of their other dragon kin. Um, the only one close to them in terms of organization is the green dragonborn, but it was only because they wanted to do very ambitious, very complicated tasks uh, that require a lot of communication and uh, cooperation and a lot of networking. But the blue dragon is very much strict hierarchy, very much like no. This is the power dynamic. I'm the one on top. This is your superior. This guy rules over you and is very rigid about it and one of the ones that most like that go in the most regular and very harsh taxations with, Dracu with old Dracuzan culture. And now we go on to the most dominant type of dragon. Uh... Oh no, 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 don't join a dragon cult. Don't join a dragon cult. No, you know what? I'll tell you. You know what? After the red dragon, I'll tell you what happens when you do, uh, when you get related to a dragon cult. Uh, because you may you may find that in lightning. You may find it. Um, you may find it more enabling, or you may find it horrifying. I don't know, and that scares me. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna move on to one of the most well-known dragons, the red dragon. Now, the red dragon is considered the apex predator. Like, the most dominant and powerful of the dragons. Uh, 
not only with its sheer size, but sheer might. They are definitely one of the most strongest in terms of brute strength. If a dra if this dragon were to fight other dragons, they're they will likely win in an all-out fight. Um, the only reason a blue or green dragon might survive in a case like this might be with their wits or cunning or perhaps uh, preparation. But say if a red dragon comes into any of these other four dragons, the chance of this dragon winning is significant. These dragons are very aggressive, and unlike their Unlike the blue dragon, which is blue and green dragons which are very calculated, these are much more related to the black dragons. And since they are very aggressive, they are more the type that won't like, they're not really there to rule an empire and like form a nation and a legacy. They are there to go, this is mine. I have it. They are one of the most stereotypical notions of a dragon because they are the ones that have formed the stereotype. The red dragon is an incredibly dangerous dragon to the fact it breathes fire, it lives often in warm environments rather deep underground or in volcanic areas so it is very hard to come up to them and challenge them. Uh, they are very much the type of dragon that will fight you for something they think that you may think is a minor thing, but if they feel it challenges their pride even a little bit, they will attack you. Blue and green dragons may have some form of restraint if they feel like it may have an advantage. A red dragon has the hubris to assume nothing is stronger than it, uh, which is a fair assumption, frankly, uh, and go out of its way if it feels wrong, slighted, or anything to immediately kill it. So, yeah, red dragons are definitely nothing to fuck around with. Um, excuse me. Oftentimes, uh, these Dracuzas would be a lot... These, their Dracuzas would not be as organized, uh, per se. These sort of Dracuzas would be encouraged by their patron dragon to just ransack. Ransack and raid. Whereas, say, like, ones from, like, uh, the green and blue Dracuzas may be more of an organized crime syndicate uh, to form a structure to uh, commit these more normal crimes uh, to get money, profit, status. Red Dragons and the Red Dracuzas would be more, all right, I want you to go to this town, establish dominance, milk them dry, and still, and like, keep bully them. Like, I think the best comparison would be the blue dragon would be a lot more like Napoleon or Caesar building their empires, gathering a, a sort of legacy, a, a sense of, yes, I am sort of the god king. I am the one in charge here. Whereas the red dragons tend to operate more like uh, the Huns where they go throughout a place, ransack them, and insist further payment afterwards. So, like, I wouldn't be surprised if we later found out that Attila the Hun was a red dragon. Maybe even Ale Alexander the Great actually would be most likely to be a red dragon. Hmm. Note to self. Look into legend lore. See if Alexander the Great may have been a red dragon. That's that's food for thought for me. Um, here, I'm gonna hold my little Charizard plush I got from uh, Ran and Elf to, to get myself into the red more of the red dragon mind space. Uh, but yes, red dragons are very brutal, very ferocious, and mo like. They may not be the one you're most likely to deal with, I would say, if you were to deal with a chromatic dragon. More likely, uh, probably green, maybe blue, uh, on average. If you're in, uh, just geography, geography, geologically speaking. Uh, but if you happen to be anywhere near what a red dragon considered its territory, 
Ooh, buddy, you're fucked. Um, even when it comes to killing, uh, red dragons, we're normally, uh, dragon hunting would be a significant, like, if one wanted to organize a dragon hunt, right, uh, even if you got, like, a group of adventurers who are very powerful, that is a significant challenge due to the fact that dragons are very, they're aerial, they're, they're tricky to actually get in to a point where you can fight them unless you have a significant amount of ranged weapons. Um, so, like, if you were to hunt down a dragon for the first place, you would have to get a lot of uh, heavy cavalry, uh, not cavalry, a lot of siege weapons for the most part. Get it. Traverse to the environment in which the dragon resides and then attempt to attack them. Uh, so, say... Or like a dream green dragonborn, uh, you would have to go into the woods with your like ballistas, your catapults, etc., and attempting to attack with large objects there, where it may be a bit cumbersome. You could probably do it, but then you get things like the red dragonborn, which is mostly in very mountainous terrain. Uh, likely, if they can, volcanic or naturally warm environments. Uh, and that's, you can't really get a lot of siege equipment there that easily. You can't get armies there to attempt to assault a dragon. Um, usually with instances of red dragons, these are very long combats, uh, if it is an army affair, accompanied with strong, capable, uh, people. Um, yeah. Uh, and red dragons in particular are a type of dragon where, like, some people can negotiate with a green dragon. Blue dragons can be a bit trickier, but negotiable. Red dragons are not a negotiable dragon. They are very much brash, aggressive, and fickle. Uh, and probably the ones most likely to hoard a lot of fucking money. And will just... The blue dragon would have, like, maybe consistent fees or taxes that it would implement and then progressively raise them to to get more power. Red Dragon would be like, I want a bajillion gold and maybe I'll leave you alone. And it's like, we don't have a bajillion gold. It's like, I know you don't have a bajillion gold, but if you had it, I'd maybe calm down for like a day. So yeah, Red Dragon, don't fuck with the Red Dragon. Red Dragon's big fucking news. Uh, I am a very powerful mage. I would not fuck with a red dragon. <laughs> what I would do if I had a red if I encountered a red dragon, I would try to banish that motherfucker so I'd have time to book it. Uh, but a part of draconic culture is not just the aspect of um of being a crime syndicate. Uh, a lot of dragons do have, they've sort of formed religions uh, based off grander draconic deities that exist in outer planes. So this would be, outer planes are typically uh, realms that most people associate with an afterlife. Uh, so say for example, an outer realm could be heaven. Uh, but another one, could be hell and that is where one draconic entity resides and this is Tiamat. Tiamat is deemed the mother of dragons. Uh, it is said that she is the one who had birthed the chromatic dragons having a head for each one uh, on her and that she is Oh yeah, excuse me. She is a very brutal and powerful mother. She is the one that had made all the dra all the chromatic dragons and had encouraged them to use their egos in entitlement uh, for their own gain. Uh, of course, um, the team, the religion of Tiamat in um, Draconic culture 
uh, is very polarized depending on which dragons that it's seen by. Uh, but mostly for its worshippers uh, in, um, in the chromatic uh, family, there you have it where she is more of something to look up to. Uh, like, you have to strive to be the level of dominance of the grandmother, essentially. Um, that she is an example of what a true dragon should be, having all the power of her, of her spawn and becoming the ultimate form of what they could be. Um, having a variety of power, not just like, I have the power of fire. Well, she has the power of all the elements, motherfucker. She's the avatar dragon. Um, and you may ask, why did I mention hell earlier? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, Tiamat is in hell. Uh, Tiamat is currently uh, bound out, uh, currently residing in the first circle of hell. Uh, and this is because for a considerable, I believe it was a millennia, maybe two, Tiamat was able to sign a contract with Asmodeus, who is the man, the devil, the fiend himself, who is in charge of hell. And she was essentially uh, given the agreement to have, to sort of get the uh, status of Archdevil and rule over the first layer of hell, which basically is welcome to hell. You have entered hell, and if anyone wants to go to hell, they have to go to you first. You are essentially the Grand Doorman. Uh, where if anyone has to go down further, you're the one who decides if they go down further unless they have uh, predisposed approval. Um, and the contract was essentially, you guard hell and any of your children may come down here to hell and essentially Asmodeus has the souls of aggressive, horrific dragons on his side. Uh, but, uh, Sovrog, you're being a very excellent point about the, the consideration that she can be brought back to Earth. Now, this is a very common prophecy and legend amongst, uh, some dragons. Uh, some dragons, uh, this is more of a green dragon or blue dragon sort of affair, but there are other dragons that do abide this. Some dragon, some chromatics do believe uh, very strongly into the sort of hierarchy of the chromatics, uh, which they decide upon, uh, which they have decided upon through uh, the symbology of Tima, which usually is a circle with five heads, uh, going up, the whites and blacks being at the bottom, blues and greens being sort of uh, higher up, and the red at the very top. Uh, this is sort of considered like the official, like yes, this is how she intended, these are like her, her children and her preferences. And some of these dragons are very radical. Some of these dragons believe that they have an important task that if they can bring Tiamat out of hell and onto earth that not only would they gain the power of you know draconic influence because Tiamat the mother of all dragons is out here the queen herself but also this would mean that they'd be mom mommy's favorite and who doesn't want to be mommy's favorite ha 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 funny mommy joke dragon hell um but yes uh that's when you get a lot of cults of tiamat that would want to bring her back 
Um, these are again more radicals. Uh, a lot of the a lot of dragon born, a lot of dragons tend to use this more as a point to bind themselves with other dragons to sort of form alliances. Um, and this may occur in some uh, grand events to uh, resurrect Tiamat. As you can see, this uh, painting trying to establish a reenactment of what that would be like. Um, currently, there has been no uh, successful attempts of bringing back Tiamat, but there have been attempts, um, and they tend to be probably one of the most clutch things. Um, I do know for me, personally, uh, those are things I factor in, I research quite a bit, uh, mostly due to the fact that, um, I, I study a lot of, uh, influences of the planes. Uh, I'm, I, I specialize in divination and conjuring, so that is seeing and also teleporting, uh, to summon and summon, teleport, and to remove. Um, and in many cases, uh, personally, I would not support uh, a Tiamat invasion, uh, because she's got other dragons in hell uh, that have been sort of reincarnated, and those are, those are not pleasant. Wait, I've never completed the cult of the Dragon Queen. Why well, I don't succeed in reviving her? Well, that would be supposedly because uh, people interfere in that. Because uh, Tiamat, uh, recently there have been um, there have been some very ambitious uh, mages who have tried to archive the capabilities of Tiamat. And they are, they are, at all intents and purposes, considered a lesser god. They are a deity, uh, not only because of their uh, praise and, pow and power they're given from it, but they actively collect souls because they are bound in hell and have the entitlement and right to collect the souls of the chromatic dragon, her children. Uh, so needless to say, uh, she's got all those heads you see, breathe out various breath weapons, uh, and can do so very quickly at a point unrecorded uh, compared to some other ones, uh, leaving some devastating damage and or combinations uh, her size is gigantuan. She is considered to be larger than life. Um, just, she is an overwhelming presence. And really the only way you could stop her is not letting her enter the prime material. Uh, oftentimes how you would try to do this is maybe trying to kill the dragon doing this. Uh, but something that may uh, affect this ritual is depending on who is perhaps running the operation. I know in um, in the cases for a lot of dragons, uh, although a lot of dragons are interested in studying magic, they more dabble in it. They may learn powerful spells here and there, but for the most part they are they're really going off of their own capabilities. Uh, I think the best way to say it, to do this is like they magic to them may be a hobby, but it's not a commitment uh, So what they would do is more likely capture a lot of people who are more powerful mages and attempt that individual or individuals to attempt the uh, opening uh, of a gate Which would probably be the best way to do it um, between hell and the prime material, which is a significant thing. Like that is, that is going into the ninth circle to create a permanent, or at least a significantly sized portal from another plane to get something or a group of things out of another plane and into ours for a significant period of time. Uh, because even for more potent conjurization like say uh shifting into another plane of existence usually that is an individual or say if you're uh in a group 
holding hands, you can get a mass group of people to one side to another, uh, but you can't really get, like, a portal set up to another plane unless you delve into a significant amount of chroma chromatic energy. Also, good night, shiny purple pants. I, I guess, like, I mean, if you join a dragon cold, just, I hope, it's, it's like Scientology, you'll just have to have a lot of money. <laughs> but, yeah, Tiamat, Tiamat is very horrifying, and to stop a ritual with her, you would have to stop, uh, either dragons, uh, several, uh, most likely one who is considering themselves the boss, and or uh, mages trying to set up a very major ritual. Um, however, the main thing that does stop these attempts is not only interference, but also because a lot of these dragons are mostly going for the idea of summoning Tiamat, that they don't really understand either the requirements uh, for the spells to work, uh, and may rush their mages, may uh, attempt to speed up a process that cannot be sped up, leading to more dramatic results. Uh, oftentimes, if you see a major um, point of planar influence, that honestly could be a point of uh, dragons trying to contact, trying to open up a portal to hell. Uh, but instead it got opened up to a different plane and that plane's influence is caught up all over the area. It's, it's very complicated. So even without interference, it's very possible that a Tiamat Resurrection Ritual will likely not work immediately. You would probably have to attempt it various times to get it fucking right. And even then, you would likely have to deal with entirely different groups of people where you'd have to, um, try to set things up. So, yeah, it's very, it is majorly, it is literally one of the most complicated processes, uh, to summon a, essentially a deity into the prime material. But, yeah, that is, that is it. I think that's pretty much all I gotta say, unless anyone else has a question in the class. I see Hell Knight is significantly late, uh, right after I talked about the funny dragon I was hinting towards. Um, so I will not, I will not repeat the entire almost two hour lecture. I apologize, Hell Knight. <laughs> But yeah, I'll leave the floor open for if anyone has any quick questions. And if not, I think I may move on and maybe make us go to another stream. I'll just have to wait till I... Well, if it helps, uh, this stream, if you want to go back, uh, Hell Knight, and watch this stream later on, I do know uh, this dragon over here is the one that will answer uh, your question for... Uh, topics about uh, a multi-handed dragon with various elements. Uh, she is Tiamat, she is the queen of dragons, uh, and she is a dragon god. So if you want to look into her, you can just watch back this stream, uh, likely in the last 20 minutes or so. Uh, but yeah, I know tomorrow what I plan on doing is I plan on doing a um, plan on doing some karaoke, which I was going to do last week, but then life happened. Um, so I wasn't able to, but tomorrow I'm going to be doing a very interesting karaoke stream where the theme is doing songs I heard a lot in 2008 while listening to Sonic AMVs. So if you're interested in what the hell that is going to be like, find out tomorrow at 9.30 p.m. EST. And, and then you will see, you will see the many angst and, and wonders of the late 2000s and Sonic AMVs. Alright, so, let's see. Oh, okay, it looks like, okay, looks like a person I haven't seen, um, streaming that much in a hot minute that we can maybe raid is Bramble Toad. 
Uh, Bramble Toad is the one that, uh, here, I'll get rid of interwebs, and I will show off, where were they, where were they, where were they? Bramble Toad is the one that made, uh, this emote, the Magic Fan emote. Uh, so, that'll be a very good thing to maybe share with him, uh, if you want, if we raid him, and if you have either, if you've either paid me money, or if you unlock the, uh, the Magic Pan emote, uh, why don't we raid it, uh, raid him with that? Was my window always red? Uh, no. That may be your end. Oh, the window? Oh, I see what you mean. This window? I think so. I've never looked towards the window. I'll be real. But I'm going to say yes. Anyway, I'm going to be putting in the raid for Bramble Toad. All right. Well, to anyone who attended this class, whether past, present, or future, thank you for coming. I hope you have a nice uh, day or evening, whatever time of day it is. I hope you just had something nice to look back on. And until then, I wish you a very humble bye bye